My name is Pastor Greg Delaney, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, because it gives you the context of why this is important to me, and why we're doing this work where we're doing it. Um, the reason SpongeBob's up there, uh, 2008 in July, that's what I looked like. I weighed about 150 pounds, I had little skinny legs, I was bright yellow, and it was because I was getting ready to die from alcohol use disorder. Um, I had grown up in the church at the tutelage of that lady right there. That is my grandmother, Clara. And if your last name was Delaney, you were in church. You were in church a lot because Clara had seven boys, one of which was my daddy. And Clara, if she looks awful passive and peaceful and loving there, but she ruled the, the roost. There was no question. If you ever want to question the toughness of my grandmother, Clara, I always tell this story that I said my dad is one of seven, and so Clara's oldest was Glenn. That was my Uncle Glenn. He was a toddler at the time, about the size of my grandson back there, Oliver, who's hanging out with us. And uh, he was toddling about the house, and she was pregnant, and as the Bible might say, her time had come to deliver. And, and uh, so she sent my grandfather off to get the midwife as they lived in the rural part of the, the state. And as he was gone, the time had come for her to deliver. And so she took the bedpost, the bed, the front of her bed, lifted it up, and my Uncle Glenn had a gown on, and she put his gown underneath the bedpost and slammed it down. And she promptly delivered my Lester Earl, my uncle, and Chester Merle, my uncle, twins by herself. So Clara was the OG way back in the day. So, but if you were part of that, if you were part of that fabric, you went to church. And so Alcohol and, and, and alcohol use disorder and all of those things associated with that was not supposed to be part of my narrative ever. Um, and thankfully, Clara, before I got really sick, she hadn't gone home to be with the Lord because I would have gone home to be with the Lord prior to if that had been the case. But in this journey of, of this, what it brought me to was in 2008, um, as I mentioned, I'm getting ready to, to die, and my wife's back there, and she was the director of palliative care at the hospital that I was in. And my journey of addiction had lots and lots of consequence. Um, it caused us to go into bankruptcy. We lost our home. Uh, she lost uh, her retirement. It was a tough, tough journey. And she stayed with it the whole time. And, and in, the, in the moment of crisis where I was at the hospital, she was kind of presented with a very interesting dilemma because I was in the ICU and I had caused her incredible hurt for about 20 years. And they had called her down to do her palliative care duty and threw the curtain back and they said, we think we should resuscitate him at least once. What do you think? And to her amazing spirit and her amazing gifting, she tells the story of going off in the corner and saying, Lord, he's tormented by this illness. I'm good if you want to take him, but if you leave him here, will you heal him? And I woke up about three days later and sitting in my room was a pastor who I really had no use for whatsoever. He was a notorious cheater at golf. He was a scoundrel in town. He was also, he was a Pentecostal. And I didn't deal with Pentecostals, you know. That wasn't part of my background. But he sat in my room and he looked across from me and there's a lot to the story I can't share today. But he came in and I was wondering why he was there because I really didn't like him. And he said, I've heard a vision from the Lord. You're going to be my recovery pastor. And I'm like, bro, I'm a drunk. There's no way that's going to happen. There's no way that's going to happen, and there's no way that's going to happen in a Pentecostal church. And God said, no, this is your journey. And I have to be honest, at that point in life, I never thought I could even get a job, much less come back to ministry. And he opened the keys to his church and opened a community of people that I intersected with. And over the last 16 years, my calling on my life with this journey was, despite having Clara and all of this incredible church upbringing, when I fell into my addiction... It was the church that didn't know what to do with me. And my folks, my people, you know, I was in that church before I was born. There's pictures of me in my mom's belly singing in the choir, right? And they didn't know what to do. And the Lord has led me to a place to say, no one should feel that way in their church when they're dealing with addiction. And so that's been the call and that's kind of the genesis of why this is important to me and where this has gone over the last 16 years. And it started with a little tiny gathering in Xenia, Ohio uh, that continues today and has you know, now expanded to some things we're going to talk about today. So that's the context, that's the lens that I'm coming from. Um, this is kind of our lives today and so my wife and I, we have lots and lots of stuff that goes on. 
Um, there's a lot to the story, um, but I've been blessed to, to kind of have this conversation with an awful lot of lovely and beautiful people, both in Ohio and across the country, and, and really kind of talking about what is it to become recovery friendly? Why is it important? Um, why do we want to establish our houses of faith to be able to not only recognize what's going on with someone with a substance use issue, but how to respond to that and then how to connect to people like y'all that are in clinics and other ministry partners that we can help to wrap around an incredible opportunity for people to find their path of recovery and, way, and ways to get better. So this particular presentation has a lot of incredible sources. I would never say that this is mine. Um, a lot of people have cure in, in curating this content to kind of say this is kind of an idea and a best practice that we're employing and it really does end up kind of being dependent. There's some fundamentals that any uh, community, any church, any group could probably you know, deploy in their particular context, but with everything there's always something unique, whether it's culturally whether it's what I've got going on demographically in my church, what I have going on in my community. And so it's not to be like a one size cookie cutter kind of thing, but inspire some thought, create scaffolding around how could I maybe create a recovery friendly congregation? How could I help that turn into a recovery friendly community? What are the other things going on in my community that I could partner with, leverage, connect to, that suddenly this particular town, this particular neighborhood in town, this particular community, suddenly folks in the addiction world said, man, I went there. And that's where not only I found recovery, but I found my purpose. I found my freedom. I found my hope. And in the context of where we're at today, I found Jesus. And everything changed with that. So that's kind of where we're coming from. So our learning objectives is why would you want to do this? Why is recovery friendly community even important? Why does it matter? And I have a dear friend, his name's Casey Steckling, and Casey does this work with me in Xenia, Ohio, where we live. And Casey has uh, kind of talked about it. He calls it the crisis at the door. And if you think about it in the state of Ohio, where we live, one in 13 people have a, are dealing with a substance use disorder. One in three families, one in three individuals, directly or indirectly, are navigating someone or themselves, family member close or coworker or whatever, that has a substance use issue. And so when you think about that, the crisis at the door, and most of the time I'm talking to church leaders, it's at your door. You just have to do the math. And so how are we equipping you for this so that no one ever feels, and it sounds a little selfish, but I never want anybody to feel the way I felt, because I felt so ashamed. I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like I had no hope. And the, and the interesting part is when I went back to my church after having a year of recovery, I went back to my home church. And I had so many people come up after that service where I kind of shared where I was that they said, we desperately wanted to help you, but we had no idea how. We knew you were a mess. And, and the whole time, I thought nobody knew, you know. And so it was just an interesting, so that's one of collaboration, we're gonna talk about the importance of it and what's happening in some communities that you can, you know, uh, take back, duplicate, replicate on your own. We're gonna talk about some hows, and that are some of the examples of recovery-friendly community movements that are happening uh, as a result that started in congregations, moved into other places. We also have something that started in the workplace, moved to another place. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about something that's happening here <clears throat> that we're working on trying to better equip our CCHF partners, our CDMA partners, about how to be better equipped to dealing with substance use disorder in a more holistic fashion. And so we, we've got a, an initiative, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You'll get a QR code. There's a way of you, if you're a clinician, you can go and get um, some CEU stuff, uh, some training in OUD, opioid use disorder stuff. And then we'll talk about some approach and some tools and some training. And so why are we doing this? And at the core of my why is something that Brennan Manning said. And Brennan was a person who dealt with addiction. Uh, he had a substance use disorder of his own. He made the statement, the greatest need for our time is the church to become what it's seldom been. The body of Christ with its face to the world, loving others regardless of religion or culture, pouring itself out in a life of service, offering hope to a frightened world. And I really like what he says here presenting itself as the real alternative to the existing arrangement. I'm gonna give you some information about what our existing arrangement in this country is when it comes to substance use disorder. Can we be the real alternative to that existing arrangement? I believe we can. And I believe we're seeing it 
and where we have employed it and deployed it, we're seeing communities that were once, when you, you have that community that you pull in and it feels a little gray as soon as you make the corner, you feel that you feel it, it's kind of, it's heavy. We're seeing light start to trickle through. We're seeing neighborhoods and streets start to have a different viewpoint because we've intersected and become the different alternative. And so what we talk about in terms of kind of the process in a recovery friendly community, it's a recognition that substance use disorder, mental illness, all those things, they're family issues. So there's an awful lot of people that are being impacted by a person who's dealing with an SUD. And so how are we looking at it from a familial approach? But when we look at it, we also have to realize that it's a complex challenge for people. It's a complex disease. And it's complex in the statement that it's chronic, it's relapsing, it's complex because it has a lot of stigma attached to it, it's complex because we have an awful lot of places that there's misinformation, it's complex because we have a lot of nefarious providers that take advantage of these folks in horrible ways. And so it's when the complexity of it, they're often, because I've been in this journey of addiction, I've had lots and lots of consequence that has chased me down and been behind me, so I've burned a lot of bridges. So maybe my family bridge has been broken. Maybe I've got a felony on my record. Maybe I don't have a car because I don't have a driver's license anymore. I mean, I was the guy in your community for a little while coming into my early recovery that was on my bicycle in the middle of the winter because I didn't have no driver's license. I wasn't going anywhere, right? So that's the truth. And so what we look at is we say, what are all those systems that are in our communities and how do they impact and connect? And how do I create relationships? Whatever is the catalyst, if the catalyst is workplace, if the catalyst is a school, if the catalyst is a church, whatever it is, it's a recognition that we have to completely and holistically take a look at how am I interacting collaboratively with all of those different pieces. That's what can be a recovery friendly community. And then I love what Jesus told us. We're all intimately linked in this stuff. And he took a little of the pressure off of us. What's he saying? I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I know the work is huge. I know what you got in front of you is a big deal. But I don't want you to get overtaken by it. If all you can do today is give a cup of cool water, check that box. Give a cup of cool water. We have an awful lot of folks that have entered into this space with us, and they'll be these little tiny United Methodist churches that sit on the corner, you know? And they've got eight, ten ladies, and they've been meeting forever. And you sit there and go, well, what can we do for the recovery community? And we don't tell them, hey, you got to start a meeting or you got to do this or they got to do that. But here's what I know you probably do. I bet you make killer chicken and noodles. I bet you rock a pot roast. So how about you make that and wander it down to the sober living house or the recovery house that's down the street. Make a relationship with them. Get to know them. Bethel here, and she knows this story. we got a dear friend. Her name is Bernie. Bernie. Um, this amazing woman of faith, and she really felt compelled to figure out how she wanted to help. So she's 70 years old. She says, man, I've lived a really good life. I've lived a great life. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and minister to girls in the jail who are there because of their substance use. And so Bernie, God love her, she goes in there with her guitar, and she's ready to kind of share life and change the narrative for these gals. And those gals ate her for lunch. And so she comes back out and she sits, you know, with several of us and we start to unpack it. And she's such a humble and gentle and amazing and teachable servant. And so we spend time and she kind of figures out what it is that this could be better. And she re-equips herself and she goes in and all she did is she changed the power dynamic from this to this. And just in that little space and then suddenly the girls who were absolutely repelled by the idea of sitting down and listening to Bernie sing now are gathering around and Bernie's bringing brownies and the narrative is changing and when those girls are leaving the jail they're reaching out to Bernie because Bernie has to celebrate recovery at her church and they know that she's connectable because she's legit and she's real and she's intimately linked with me in this harvest work and all she started with was a little strum of her guitar it wasn't that big heavy lift and then out of that has now been a linkage in a community and, and then lives have been changed so that's the cool part about it but this is the truth of the matter when we look at the why of this, this is a snapshot and it's a little dated. That one in seven is now one in five. 90% of our country that suffer with a substance use disorder started before they were 18 years old. Why is that critical for us to do prevention? And that's a whole other talk that we can do another day. 
We're in about 45 schools talking about that. But here's the sad part. Only 7% of people who are really dealing and having trouble with substance use disorder will seek treatment because of the stigma. And this isn't to call anybody out, and this isn't to make it uh, in confrontational at all, but where is the highest level often of that stigma? Amen. It's the church. It's the church that says, got a mom inside a church in Pickerington, Ohio, and the mom comes and says, my son is dealing with a, you know, a, an addiction to opioids, and, and, but he's doing better, and I really feel compelled. Could we do an NA meeting here in our church in the basement? Could we serve him and serve his friends? And so we get in the meetings, and we gather all the meeting people, and this is a suburban church, and they're lovely people. They're great people, and we get about 95% done, and then suddenly that trustee, that guy comes in and says, you know what? They'll probably steal the coffee maker. We're not going to do it. We still got that going on. That's a sad truth. So this is, this is the why and the stigma. And so our approach to recovery-friendly communities, we kept it super simple. We just go about asking two questions. What can my community do in order to serve an individual? What can my church do? What can my workplace do? What do I have in my hand? What do I have at my disposal? What can I do and then how can I support the family? So we're going to talk about a very specific uh, effort that's going on right now uh, in the country. Um, and it's called the Good Samaritan Network. And what we ask of our communities to do, and whoever gets involved in this, is we help them to recognize substance use. We try to strip the stigma away. We help them decide how they can respond. As I mentioned, it could be chicken and noodles, and it could be opening a clinic. It could be having a co-located intensive outpatient service on their campus, which is what we have at the church that I serve in. So it can go all kinds of ways, but the most important piece is referring. In, in the Good Samaritan Network in New Hampshire, they realized that they needed to kind of champion and, and get the rally going and get people excited about it. So they added the R of rally to get their communities excited about it. Because I don't know if you know, the state of New Hampshire, where God is doing a remarkable thing in the recovery community, is the least churched state in our union. And so, of course, God sends us into the toughest place in the world to try to do it. But it was great, and it's been great. Because this is what recovery is. When we're looking at what is the goal, what's the objective, this is SAMHSA. This, isn't, this is the folks that kind of set the standard for all this. And if you take a look at some of the things that recovery is, what we're trying to help someone go from that place of absolute desperation where they're completely bound by their addiction, where their disease has got the complete stranglehold, it's the most important relationship in their life, to that place of freedom, we've identified four things, home, health, community, and purpose. When I take a look at the community part, that's what we're trying to cultivate into. When you guys think about CCHF and your relationships to what you do now, think about that, you're the health part. Then we see people that are offering homes. And then we talked earlier in a session at one o'clock about the power of purpose. Creating purpose creates spiritual resiliency. Resiliency and recovery is critical because it allows us to handle the adversity that comes in the journey of recovery. But if we take a look at some things, we have to realize there's many pathways. It's supported by peers and allies. You folks are all allies in that work. And then it talks about how do I rejoin or rebuild my life? And so a recovery-friendly community is setting and pulling down barriers and taking down obstruction and creating pathways for somebody that, can, that, that never had that opportunity before because either they were stigmatized, they were fearful, that job said no, they pulled the garage door down, or they were told, I don't want you to steal the coffee maker. We're taking that off the table. So what is a recovery friendly congregation? When we talk about a recovery, con recovery friendly congregation, and this is kind of the map from our friends in New Hampshire, we come to them and we say, first of all, we want you to be a place that understands. That's education. We do about a six hour training on addiction 101, mental health 101, trauma informed care. We talk about how to have a conversation around suicidal ideation. We encourage a connection to your NAMI organization and it sets the scaffolding for additional training if you want it. And then we partner you with whatever your mental health, public health, whatever entity that does mental health first aid, that takes that next step and does assist, that goes the deeper and helps you become a trauma practitioner if you want to. We just set the foundation. We give you the baseline with the training so that's how you understand. And then it's a place to begin because who we target in the congregation is not the pastor. He's got way too much on his plate. We need to find the people who are intersecting you when you're walking in, ushers, lay leaders, altar workers. 
If you think about a trauma-informed approach, I think we heard our first keynote speaker talk about it. I, I was watching in the nursery area, but she was talking about it. What did she say? She said, how much changed when I changed the narrative to what's wrong with you to what happened to you? That's the core of a trauma-informed approach. Now, I want you to think about this. If you're an intercessor, if you're a prayer partner, if you're the guy that has to wear the lanyard or the gal that wears the lanyard after service and people come down and pray with you, think about how it changes the way that we intercede and the way we pray just with that simple shift in, that, that simple shift in what we ask. Because if they come down to the altar and they're looking for prayer and we ask them what's wrong, well, they're at the altar because something's wrong. If they knew what was wrong, they probably wouldn't be there. But if I turn it around, I say, tell me what's going on. My dad is really sick. My kid got in really big trouble at school. I went to the doctor and I've got this thing. My nephew is incarcerated right now because he got picked up on a drug charge. What does that do for me? Now there's a space and a place in it in a way that I can intercede differently. I can pray about that, but then that gets my mind to saying, okay, where else, what are my other solutions, other possible opportunities to help serve into that space that God has given to me, has intersected to me in this moment? Maybe do I have somebody down at the jail? Could I encourage him to put up a, a kite in the jail and ha have a mental health professional come and talk to him? Do I know what that relationship looks like? So that's the kind of stuff that we're helping. And then it comes back to a place to support so whatever's going on, if somebody goes off to treatment, if somebody's in that recovery house, whatever that journey is for that individual, that family, we got this really cool thing called prayer in the Holy Spirit. It's our superpower. So how do we support that? Man, every day, you got your time. Man, there's Bill and there's Janie and there's, man, there's the Smith family. Lord, we lift all of them up to you right now. And we're, we're, in, their, we're in their corner and they know we're in their corner. Right? And it's a place that I can return to because suddenly all that scaffolding's there and all of that understanding is there, that netting is there. And so when I come back, I'm not coming back to a church that I feel shame in. I don't have to come back and pretend like I didn't go to treatment. I don't have to come back and pretend that I'm not on probation. Right? I don't have to pretend and not let anybody see my ankle monitor because they are not shocked by it. They're like, okay, we can work with that. And I know I can't take you to the Golden Corral outside the county without setting it off. We get it. It's okay. We'll do that, right? Then it's a place to grow. How do I grow in that, right? So what we have going on in New Hampshire is we have recovery-friendly congregations. It's a little snapshot there, but we have 25 of them in the state of New Hampshire. They call it fostering change. That's their recovery. So they've taken this baseline stuff, and they create the narrative that's culturally appropriate for them in New Hampshire, and they build a program around it. And we ask them to, and we, and we encourage all the churches, lots of different theology, lots of different doctrine that are a part of this movement, right? This is Matthew 25 stuff. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was addicted, and you helped me recover. I was traumatized, and you didn't go crazy. You didn't think I was crazy. You loved me with dignity, right? All of those things. And so what we want to do is really encourage churches to leverage their time, their energy, and their creativity and in the case of Good Samaritan Network, they wanted to educate, equip, and activate. And that's what runs their particular program. Then they decided, because their governor, Sununu, created this initiative called the Recovery Friendly Workplace. The Recovery Friendly Workplace says, as a, as a, as a place of business, we're going to recognize that we have 21 million people in this country. There's probably some of them in our community that are in recovery. But they come with baggage. They come with felonies. They come with requirements to get to treatment three days a week. They come with some other stuff. They've got some stuff they got to do with children's services. They've got some things on their plate. How do we, as a workplace, begin to make our workplace opportunities more recovery friendly? Could we be accommodating? Can we change the schedule a little bit? Can we sit there and say, we know Billy's got to go to IOP from 9 to 11. Maybe we don't schedule him till 12 to 8. We create space and opportunities. Coming out of this also in the recovery-friendly workplace movement are places that are second-chance employers. So in the state of Ohio, where, where I'm hanging out, we got a group called Emerge. Emerge, a group of three founders, all entrepreneurs, bought the old trade center in our particular community, 250,000 square feet. They're HVAC people, electricians, plumbers, um, fire suppression experts, and they opened a trade school 
opened a residential opportunity for men in recovery, all faith-based, church runs there, I can go into there, I have a place to live, I get my intensive outpatient services with a licensed provider, I can get the care that I need, and then I can go over and get a trade, and then, oh, by the way, after the trade's over, I'll give you a job to come back and be an HVAC technician and to be a plumber, and suddenly I'm not saddled with all of that baggage to where all I can do is maybe be at Wendy's or maybe be over here. Now I have an opportunity where I'm $35 an hour. I'm a different purpose, right? And suddenly out of that, now I can feel the dignity to be a dad and figure out how to do the dad thing because I can, you know, I can, I can help my family. So in New Hampshire, what they decided to do is they said, okay, if you're going to be a recovery-friendly congregation, then your church is a recovery-friendly workplace. So we're going to take our two trainings and we're going to put them together. And so you can either go down the recovery-friendly workplace track or the recovery-friendly congregation track. But when we're finished, your church is a recovery-friendly workplace that's a recovery-friendly congregation. So in the workplace side of it, the secretary, the employees, the folks that you know, clean the joints, they're the ones who are the recovery-friendly workplace trainees. And the culture of the church, the recovery-friendly congregation, lay leaders, pastors, and everybody. And so suddenly what happens in that church is suddenly you've got this incredible cultural change, shift, both in the business side of the church as well as the church side of the church. Does that make sense? And so these are just a couple of them, Restoration Church, New Market, are, are churches that have done both. Interestingly enough, all the purple states have a recovery-friendly workplace initiative. So if you're from one of those, we can begin to have a conversation and narrative that maybe your churches aren't quite ready for this, but maybe we can start to partner with the recovery-friendly workplace initiative that you're doing and maybe create some training and some on-ramps and some off-ramps for the folks that we want to serve. And what's pretty cool about it is Nevada and New Hampshire were a couple of the first ones. And in both cases, they have been incredibly steward-minded with what they've learned. So they just give it away to other states to, to work on. So in the, in the state of New Hampshire, that's the journey that they say. So I like what Blanchard said. When we talk about the why, a clear purpose will unite us, the values will guide us, and the goals will focus our energy. No one can do everything, everyone can do something. And so what we're seeing as this has kind of evolved, coming from the ground up as a movement, not being mandated from the top down, Sununu is in support of it, which is wonderful. Governor DeWine across the river, he's very much in support of it with us in Ohio. But he's not asking, he's not creating any mandate, not creating any kind of structure. He's saying, let's let it organically come up and what recovery friendliness looks like to you church, you workplace, you community. Let's let you figure it out based on what your community needs what your community has. What's going to happen on the west side of Dayton, which is predominantly an African-American community, lots of amazing African-American churches over there, is going to be very different than what's happening on the east side of Dayton, which is no farther separated than from here for us to go over to the Red Stadium. But the culture in those two areas are de decidedly different. But we've been able to apply the scaffolding in both, and both are finding their path based on the folks that live around them, the culture that they're in. So the model is pretty simple. When we go into a community, we sit there and go, what do we have? Let's make an assessment. Is there a recovery community organization? Who are our friendly congregations? We just had a gal from Portland here, and she was so discouraged about what's happening in her town because she feels like she can't get the momentum. And I looked at her, and I said, you'll never get all the churches, but you'll get a remnant of them. And she about fell out of her chair because this is the second time somebody talked about the remnant to her today. And the remnant is just that group that are called the smaller group of dead. And in that remnant, God will use that remnant, just a part, to create the inspiration for the greater good, right? So we go and find everybody that's in that and try to engage them. Then we educate, bring best practice, clinical best practice, workplace best practice, you know, faith-based pra best practice. And we try to coalesce the best possible solutions for the community that we're in. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. And then we have toolkits and seminars and master classes. We're, we're soon going to have our entire recovery-friendly curriculum for congregations online to where it's going to be video-based because we're finding that no one can give me six hours, but they can give me little shots of 45 minutes. So let's make it Netflixy. Go watch it when you want to. We'll figure out how to get you certified or whatever. A um, really good example of that was in the city of Finley in Ohio, a town of about 200,000. 
we were approached by the board that oversees all the mental health and addiction services in Finley. So that's a government agency supported by levy dollars in that particular community that set the standard and create all the providers for mental health and addiction services. The faith community came to them, picked up the phone and said, hey, we've got a problem. Post COVID, internally and externally, we think that our parishioners, our congregants and others are consuming alcohol at an alarming rate. And some of the stories were, you know, I used to take the trash to the curb on Tuesdays and I'd have a bottle of wine in there. Now I have five. Something's up. So then they came to us, coalescing the best, and said, we kind of want to talk about this from a soul perspective, maybe some unique perspectives. And so we gathered four incredible women in the space, one a body, mind, spirit expert, one a soul healing expert, one an EPT expert, and another as a life coach. We shot video of all that they did. They did a, a series of TED Talks. We attached all of their material to it. We put it on a Vimeo channel, and we pushed it out to Finley so they can watch it on demand. And then coming out of that, we'll create re new recovery friendliness in those churches, and those folks will then know, I can put my hand up if I feel like my alcoholism is a little out of control. And if I'm at Dutch Vandersloot's church in the middle of town, he's one of those recovery friendly places, I can go up to him and then he'll connect me according to what's around him and to those tools that we've built. Hopefully that makes sense. So it begins with education. And so what we did for New Hampshire is we took what we had learned at Recovery Ohio. I sit with Governor Mike DeWine's Recovery Ohio advisory as his faith-based guy. And we took all of this that we've learned over time, including our partnership with Health and Human Services, and we created a curriculum, and then they decided this was what was important to their recovery-friendly communities, that it was shared pr principles and values in a community. You had to have something that felt like we, I belonged, the moral and spiritual guidance. You can see it there. You don't need to read it there. And then internally, this guy in their community decided he was going to take it one step further. He was going to take what we did, and he turned it into a certified curriculum within the state of New Hampshire called Recovery Informed Congregations. And now there's no need for me to ever go back because Ron is running the show. And so Ron now partners with the Recovery Friendly Workplaces in New Hampshire and the Re Recovery Friendly Congregations in New Hampshire and provides all the training. And Ron was such a humble and he's an amazing servant of the Lord. And he sat in on when I came in and he parsed it together and so he's now taking the ball for the work that's happening there. Because this is what drove New Hampshire. Good Samaritan Network is a 501c3 nonprofit, but it is a community connection organization. They don't have any bricks and mortar. They're just there to create collaborative uh, engagement across communities. <clears throat> so they ask these questions. What if we could create a world where someone feels safe? What if the community understood how to support them? And then this is what they believe. This is their North Star. This is what they decided. And so they sit in the middle of the recovery-friendly workplace, recovery opportunities, community partnerships, the faith community, prevention, everything. And they're now seen in the communities in New Hampshire that are doing this work, faith-based and other, that if I can always start there, they're the hub. And so regardless where I am, they may be able to find me a recovery-friendly congregation, a workplace, a partnership. They have one of the most fascinating models in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's a four-story building. The first floor is just a drop-in center for homelessness. The second floor is a medication-assisted treatment facility. So that if somebody decides they come in and they're ready, they're kind of done, it's, it's over, they go up and that group is a faith-based organization. The third floor is a temporary agency for those that are doing better to maybe find a recovery-friendly workplace for them to work. The fourth floor is residency for men that if they're still on that journey, they can go up and find a place to live at a very inexpensive thing, all integrated. And what's crazy is it sits next, right next door to the homeless shelter in town, and, and this is a tragedy. When I was there last, uh, last fall, the day that we went to go visit, um, the 1269 is what it's called, we went to visit them. They were having folks getting into treatment. The other homeless shelter, which was just warehousing people, not trying to engage and have, being curious and asking questions, trying to help, we had six overdoses that day. So we know it works just depending on where somebody might land. And so the goal of, in our churches is to create congregational capital. And what are we doing with that? You can see it there. It's how do I help communities of faith lend what they have, time, talent, treasure. Maybe it's their space. Maybe it's spiritual practice, their networks. All in, a, in an idea of I'm lending it into the greater good of what we're doing in our community. 
right? Lending it into the greater good of what we're doing in our community. If we have time, I'll tell you about something that's going on in the community near me. And then we had some proven ideas about how do I create engagement in those rallies, right? So we know the Celebrate Recovery is a proven model. So if a church put up their hand, they said, hey, we got 67 volunteers. This is what we want to do. It's pretty cookie cutter. It's plug and play. We go and engage Celebrate Recovery to help them. In the case of the walk in their shoes, about three weeks ago in the city of Akron, we had 1,000 people gather at the community theater on the University of Akron campus where 48 community providers gathered in the lobby of that theater while four people tell their, told their story of recovery, of surviving suicide, of surviving human trafficking, and then what they were doing in the faith community to serve that. A thousand people showed up. And you know who built that? One mom. A mom whose kid right now is still incarcerated. Name's Trish. So she goes to a church, Compass North, their recovery-friendly church, but she's the catalyst, and now we have connected her to everything that's around her, not only in Akron, but in Summit County, so that when somebody came to that event, they realized, I really do have a recovery-friendly community that's surrounding me. Because suddenly I thought nobody did anything, and now 48 of you are ready to do everything, or do anything for me, right? So it's a beautiful, beautiful evening. Um, so in R Good Samaritan Network, they also realized it wasn't the job of the pastor. And so in their recovery-friendly congregational model, they created something called a recovery advocate. It's not a peer supporter. It's just somebody maybe with shared experience, but this is what they are. They're compassionate, empathetic, sometimes shared experience, relational, empowered by the congregation. They have their support. But that recovery advocate then acts as conduit back and forth to those community partners and begins to try to create the fabric to make the recovery community grow, right? And so then they're reporting back to their pastors, reporting back into their church community, and maybe when they do need that you know, bowl of chicken and noodles, that's what they can do, okay? So this is a recent article by the gal in New Hampshire who's driving this, and this is Lauren McCormick. The reason she's not here doing this for you today is she is great with child, as we talked about babies, so she's not here today. But this was something that they just recently had a, an article in, in Journeys Magazine in New Hampshire talking about how faith organizations have been Im incredibly important in New Hampshire against stigma. And in the article, she talks about all of those things that were in red, what drives Good Samaritan Network in building a recovery-friendly community in the communities of New Hampshire. Okay? So in Ohio, it's a messy slide, but this is what we're talking about, the integration of this. Within a community, I have all of this stuff and I've got all of these people who are being impacted, and they're unique. Each family is unique. And so how am I creating, and you can see all of the arrows are back and forth. How am I creating collaborative, integrated relationships all in an effort to serve this, right? Now, what does that require me to do sometimes? I'm going to I'm gonna have to get out of my, we were laughing at the beginning. I'm going to have to put down some things in my community, especially the faith folk. Right? Because we have faith animosity that sometimes is a little weird. I was telling them, you know, well, I can't partner with that Lutheran guy because we got in a fight on the softball field 12 years ago. Well, I'm not going to do that. Right? That has to all go away in order for this to work. The collaboration piece is the key. And so we're seeing this in some of our communities. And before I get to that, I'll give you an example. So we had a pastor in, in our hometown. Pastor Nathan Funk, and somebody, you got the time for me. So Nathan is uh, on this campus of this particular church. He, um, we have kids, and we're in kind of, they're in kind of the toughest part of town. And so kids come over because have, they have a big parking lot, and he, um, he just started to ask the kids their names. He was new. And he started giving them snacks. And they started asking questions like, what goes on in that big building over there? And we started to really kind of unpack these kids. And then suddenly he felt like he heard from the Lord that I can't change the city until I change my neighborhood. Now, this neighborhood is tough, tough neighborhood. But I can't change my city. And so he went out and he mapped what he called his neighborhood. And he took the 127 acres that surrounded church and said, 
That's my neighborhood. They called it the 127. They called it the 127 so he could get handles around it. And then he said, I got all these kids coming over, so here's what he did. He sat down, and all these kids are dealing with parents and others that are, that are navigating substance use issues, health issues, felony issues, all that stuff. That's the neighborhood. And so he sits down with these kids and says, if I could do anything on this campus, what would you want me to do? They said, well, you build us a playground. So here's how God works. I don't know how to build a playground, right? He's sitting there going, I don't know what to do. And so he's having a staff meeting one day. And in the staff meeting, he's kind of telling them, hey, these kids are giving this vision, and we really think we could do this. And this will make sense in a second. And while he's talking, one of his staff members says, you know what? I think my sister-in-law has a friend that builds playgrounds. Right? And we're like, okay. Not only does she build playgrounds, she is Miss Terry Hendy, who has built internationally renowned playgrounds and intergenerational play spaces. Right? And she lives 20 minutes from the church. We call her. Nathan calls her. Call her. And she says, I'd be honored to do that. So then we got to thinking, very fields of dreamy, right? Fields of dreams sit there, you build it, and they're going to come. And here was what was crazy. We had a little tiny play set on the, this campus. And it had like a little roof on it, on the slide. It was kind of like a fort. We had to tear it down. They had to tear it down. It was, you know, I think Pastor Nathan described it as a tetanus shot waiting to happen, right? And one of the kids comes over, he's about 10 years old, and he says, why did you tear that down? And we're like, man, it was dangerous. We couldn't let you keep it that way. And he's like, that's where I go when my mom and dad are fighting. That was my safe place. And so what New Hampshire is starting to experience and what others are starting to experience is, is not necessarily just this recovery community, it's the community. And the community is desperate for their faith places and their other places to become safe places. And not only safe places, but if we build it, they're going to come. And so what has happened with this particular project, all of a sudden we started to realize, how are we going to serve the 127 as a recovery-friendly community? And what came along was we had a mental health provider that now is co-located on the campus, ready to take folks in a trauma-informed way and provide mental health and addiction services. We realized we had a little girl homeless we have 150 homeless in this tiny community of 25,000. This little homeless uh, gal, 14, is coming over for snacks. We start to get to know her. She suddenly says, hey, I think I might want to get baptized. We're like, okay, we need to talk to your mom. We can't find her mom because her mom and her couch surfing, right? Finally, we get a hold of mom. She's going to get baptized. We take her. We have, you know, have the little class before baptism just to make sure you kind of know this is what's going to happen. She can't read can't make this up. Within one day, because we're a recovery-friendly community, because we're talking to each other, we suddenly realized Mike Gawine has an initiative called the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. So every kid of zero to five in the state of Ohio will get 60 books before they're in kindergarten. You just have to sign them up. And so I called my library and I said, I'd like to do that for the little kids. But I said, what do you got for kids that are 14? And God sends the library of that community into the church, and she goes, I've got all these tutors with nothing to do. Do you think we could do something here at this campus with them? God then sends another gal who's got a grant sitting waiting to serve the homeless population and the homeless youth in that community. And she says, I just don't have a place to do it. And he goes, well, you can do it at my place. And now suddenly that's got the attention of the commissioners and getting the attention of a real estate organization that just bought land in that same community to build houses. And they came and said, hey, we're kingdom folks. We want to tithe into what you're doing in the 127. And what we believe is going to happen with the 127, it'll be a model of how to be recovery friendly, how to be uh, you know, that intimate linkage part of God and be able to pluck that up and put it somewhere else. So that's just an example of when you go off and start to have those conversations and create that pattern of, I want to serve in that space, realizing that there's a very complicated group of people that we're working with, and their kids are complicated as well. That's how it gets. Now, in terms of addiction recovery services here for CCHF, there is a budding effort, if you're part of a clinic, called Arise. And we're trying to create the alcohol, um, Addiction Recovery Integrated Service Exchange. And it's really early. Warren Yamashita, who will be talking tomorrow in one of the sessions, he's behind this. 
And here is a QR code that if you're a clinician or you're someone who's wanting to know more about addiction medicine and wanting to find out what your clinic can do in addiction medicine, this is an eight-hour class that you can come and get the education that you need in order to be a uh, opioid use treatment provider, dispenser, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Other, yeah, sure. Other efforts that are going on, I'm going to go quickly. Um, the, and then you'll see, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap it up toward the end. Very passionate about it, but what I'm hoping that you're taking away is as you're thinking, God has planted you in a certain place for a certain time with a certain sphere of influence. I've told you that this is the crisis that's at the door. One of the things that I like to encourage people that getting involved with people who are trying to find recovery from substance use disorder is as a church and a purpose, if you engage them, you get to watch resurrection happen live. Where a person is on day one and where they are on 90, on day 120, on day 180, is they're a different person. And I firmly believe that it has to feel like what it was like to walk around with Jesus and watch him heal people. And so if you're looking for that purpose of why would I want to do it, I want to give you purpose to say, why wouldn't you want to do it? And we firmly believe that this is where revival is coming. So in Ohio, we have a good community project, again, a collaborative project. This is part of it. But I love what this is said by uh, Graham Bell. The great discoveries improvement and improvements invariably involve the cooperation of many minds. One of the things that makes recovery-friendly communities work in New Hampshire, and it's making it work in pockets of Ohio and other places, is when we all can leave logos and egos at the door. And it is us doing the work. And he is getting the glory. And that's what's tricky. I spend a lot of time with nonprofit leaders and others, and they'll say, I am super successful at connecting a clinic and connecting this little nonprofit and this group that does that and this group that does that. But man, when I have to cross the threshold and talk to the church, I don't. So, how do you inspire the people around you is your take home, it's your homework. I want you to go think about it, pray about it. In your sphere of influence with what you have, your time, talent, treasure, your time, energy, and creativity, if this is something, you're in this session because maybe you're in this space, how do I inspire those around me? And then realize that you are going to encounter people as you're looking to collaborate with them that act like this. The problem appears to be unsolvable. Maybe we could run some computer simulations. There are too many variables that would take forever. We've got to be missing something. Let's start again. The movie is playing here at 7.20, here at 7.30, <laughs> here at 8.10, and here at 8.45. All right, these theaters have to be eliminated. Why? They're state-of-the-art, digital projection, 20-channel surround sound. Yes, but they have no icy machines. <laughs> Despite my aggressive letter-writing campaign, I might add. Wait, what about the multiplex here? The seats are terrific. They have Twizzlers instead of Red Vines. No amount of lumbar support can compensate for that. <laughs> well, it's going to take at least an hour to eat, and I don't see a Sheldon-approved restaurant proximate to a Sheldon-approved theater. <laughs> We could eat off to the movie. Unacceptable. The delay would result in tomorrow morning's bowel movement occurring at work. <laughs> hang on, hang on. There's a 7-Eleven here. We smuggle Slurpees, which are essentially ices, in under our coats after having a pleasant meal either here, here, or here. Wow. I don't see how we missed that. Excuse me, in what universe are Slurpees ices? <laughs> That's how we missed it. Sheldon, would you be prepared on a non-presidential basis to create an emergency ad hoc Slurpee Icy equivalency? Oh, Leonard, you know I can't do that. <laughs> okay, I guess we only have one option. Yep, I don't see any way around it. Bye, Sheldon. See ya. Little dude. <laughs> They're right, it was the only option. So I want to encourage us all. How do you inspire people? Because the thing is, is as you do this, what do we say? I'm only 7% of the people that have an issue feel comfortable because of stigma. We have spent the last 10 years in the state of Ohio aggressively trying to eliminate stigma when it comes to substance use disorder. And with that, that stigma causes delay and it causes lots of Sheldon conversations and lots of that kind of thing. But how can you, given what you have in your community, how do you go about inspiring this in other people? 
And what I would encourage you to, to, to do is I, I'm happy to come to your community, to your church, to talk about you becoming a recovery-friendly congregation, sitting down with your leaders talking about how to become a recovery-friendly community, how do we do a recovery-friendly workplace initiative, wherever you're at. Because here's what I know. Some of the most amazing stories are coming out of this particular population. Folks that then are incredible inspiration to other people. And I'll leave you with this. I was on the phone uh, sitting out in this parking lot. We're doing some work with Lutheran Family Services in South Carolina. I was just telling uh, Michael a little bit about being not far from where he's hanging out. And, but we have a gal that is the new liaison there, and so she and I were talking about how to do the next wave. We've had some early adoption from several Lutheran churches and some of the community leaders of the homeless shelter, and so it's starting to cobble itself together. It's cobbling itself together around their particular Lutheran services hub, and they've got a little recovery community organization kind of thing there. But I didn't know this new person, and so she's trying to get to know me, and I'm trying to get to know her, and I always ask, tell me, why do you want to do this work? And I, everybody I go to, that's the first conversation we have. You have to be able to tell me why. You can tell me what you want to do, I don't care. Until you tell me why you want to do it, then we can't go, because if you don't have a really solid why, your what will not make it. And so I just said, why do you do this? In this story, I could not believe it. She says, I'm in recovery. I've been in recovery for about 10 years. And she said, in 2015, I was in recovery. She has three children. I was in recovery, and the guy I was dating at the time asked me to come to the park. And I went to the park to see him. And he stabbed me 27 times. And he tried to bury me alive. She said, I fell into like a creek that was there and I floated down the creek and these people found me and I had all kinds of surgeries and it was a long story. And I said, and she said, you have no idea how many times I wanted to go out and just be high and take the pain away. And I said, why didn't you? And she said, because I had a community around me that I was connected to, they cared about me and they loved me through the stuff and they helped me back on my feet. And I never once, and, and it was so fascinating when she told the story, because she said there were two or three moments in that horrible moment that she knew God spoke to her directly. The voice that she heard of the people that got her out from under the, the, the little dock that she landed on, they did, she didn't hear their voice, she heard the voice of her mother who had passed away. And she tells this amazing story of God, God's hand on her for a, a, a new and greater purpose. And I sit there and I go, we don't have her story if she doesn't have that community. She doesn't make it. She doesn't survive. And so if you're looking for a why, you sit there and go, I want to have that why of Anne. And I just sat out there and I was just, I was just astonished. I thought I'd heard everything about the people that are in this, and I don't. There's a new story every day. But when, with, what I think, and it's not to put any pressure on us, but I think we owe it to Anne to build more places that Anne's need and that Anne's can feel connected to. And it's not a church, and it's not a place, and it's not a thing, it's us. And it's us coming around her in a way that she believes that the community is with her and for her, and we can do that. I believe we can do that. Can I pray over you? Father, I'm just so grateful for this group. Grateful for the time that they spent. Lord, I pray that what they came in expecting, they got a little bit of what they needed. Lord, I pray that if there's a way that we can serve together, uh, Lord, open that door. Um, Lord, we're grateful for the work that you're doing in New Hampshire. We're grateful for the model of seeing 25 congregations acting as catalysts to change their community. Lord, we're thankful for the other places where we're seeing the budding of this and the emergence of this. And, and Lord, we know it's all you. But Lord, we know we've got a big lift to go. There need to be more. And so, Lord, I pray today that, um, that we'll continue to find those places that inspire us. What inspire us? How do I look at the things around me? And how do I put those to use to serve the people that we know are hurting, the kids that we know are affected, and create communities that are not just recovery friendly, but are communities of conduit, communities of access to your amazingness, your power, your healing, your glory. So Lord, thank you for these folks that have honored me with their time today. 
Um, Lord, I pray blessing and safety over all of them as they travel home. And we do all of this today because you have done amazing work in each one of us. And it's in your name. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your time. Thanks a lot.